the third Saturday of every May for the last 23 years, there's been a parade in Whalen, Minnesota. Now, you know about parades, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade and others even in our own city. This is a bit different. Uh, Whalen, Minnesota only has two blocks in its downtown. It's a small town. And so th they want to have a parade. They do something unique. It's called a standstill parade. They have a band, they have a float, they have the veterans of foreign wars, they have uh, uh, color guard and all the rest. But the parade stands still and the people move. The people walk beside it and walk around it and everybody sees it and it's a wonderful experience. I like that idea. But it makes me think about my life and yours. Do you ever feel like you are just standing still and the whole world is passing you by. You're not going anywhere. Well, we're at the beginning of a new year, and it's time, a new decade, and it's time to think about moving forward, not standing still anymore. But what we need is vision. So for the next three Sundays anyway, I'm going to be talking about having 2020 vision. Seems natural to talk about it, doesn't it? A 2020 vision. Today, we want to talk about having a vision for the rest of your life. You can't do anything about the past. That's gone. Shut the book. Shut the door. Turn away and now face forward. What are you going to do for the rest of your life? And then we'll talk about having a vision for your family and having a vision for our church. You know, in six months, we're going to be in the new facility that's how close we are now, and it's exciting. We need to think about what's the vision for our church as the days go on. I invite your attention today to Mark chapter 10. Would you turn there? Mark chapter 10. Having a vision for the rest of your life. There's a listening guide inside your program. If you're new to us, you can get that out. You know, sometimes people will ask me Wednesday or Thursday, they'll say, Pastor, what did you preach on Sunday? And I can't remember. And I'm the guy who preached it. And that just makes me think you probably can't remember it either. But if you take notes, even if you never look at them again, just because you wrote something down, you're putting it deeper into your soul. So if you don't mind, if it helps you, Use that. And we've got children in the room today who are not normally here, and they've got a special set of questions for the sermon, and they're going to be listening. So don't bother them, okay? Don't distract them because they're listening to the sermon to get down some things that are not on the other outline that you may be looking at this morning. Chapter 10, verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around him and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God, all things are possible with God. And I would encourage you to underline that one. You need that this year. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up. We've left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel 
will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. To help us this morning, we're going to be looking at the life of the rich young ruler. This story is told in three gospels, but he's never called the rich young ruler. This is a composite. It is in Matthew that we learn that he was a young man. It's in Luke that we learn that he was a ruler of some kind, and all three tell us that he was wealthy. And he inherited it. That's why he, it's natural for him to say to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He had great, great wealth. And because he's a young man, it's possible that that wealth could have turned him into a self-indulgent, rather boorish individual. He could have been lazy. He could have been out of control, spending his money and riotous living. But no, he doesn't do that. There's every indication that this rich young ruler is serious. He's serious about this life, and he's serious about the life to come. Now, that's kind of unusual to be a young man and thinking about eternity, but he's got all of this on his mind. And so he comes running with enthusiasm to Jesus to ask him that very question. I like this guy. And I, I think you do too. I like him because he's ethical and he's basing his life on God's standards. He's ethical. He's living an ethical life. Jesus answers his question by saying, you know the commandments, don't you? And the young man says, yes. Jesus said, don't, uh, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't lie, don't steal. Honor your father and your mother. It's the Ten Commandments. But if you know the Ten Commandments from Exodus, you know that Jesus is leaving some of them out. He's not giving the ones about how we relate to God. He cites the ones about how we relate to one another. He's, he's laying out the standards of God for a moral, just society. And so today, you may not be a Christian. You might be Muslim. You might be Jewish. You might be nothing but these are still the basic ethical standards for how a society functions. If we give these up, if we say they're relative, they don't matter, then we're going to have chaos in this world. And that may explain why in many places we do. This is how God wants us to live. And the young man says, all of them I have practiced since I was just a boy. Now, I doubt that. But Jesus doesn't say anything. Jesus lets him go with it. It's important that we feel like we're good people. Have you discovered that in your life? Don't you want to feel like you're a good person, that you're, you're not like everybody else? You see the problems in the world, but at le and you don't do everything right, but at least you can look your face in the mirror and feel good about yourself. This young man does. He's very high, has a very high opinion of himself. The problem is sometimes we can think too highly of ourselves. We can think too much of ourselves, that we are too good, and we forget that all of us are sinners. All these I have kept from the time I was just a child. Well, Jesus knew that wasn't true because he, in the Sermon on the Mount, said, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you've committed murder in your heart. If you've looked lustfully upon another human being, you've committed adultery in your heart. And, and we're all guilty. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, there's none righteous, no, not one. He's living his life the best way he knows how. He's trying to be a good, moral person but still he's a sinner and maybe he's forgotten it. This week while we were gone, we were with my son and his wife and when we got down to Florida, he, he said, Dad, have you noticed you've got a chip in your windshield? And I hadn't noticed it. It was very small. He said, Dad, you need to take care of that if you don't because it had just happened to him, he told me. If you let it go, it's only going to get wider and wider until eventually that uh, windshield is going to have to be replaced. 
So I spent one day of vacation at Safe Flight Replace, Safe Flight Repair. <laughs> you have to say it that way. And, uh, and Keith was the worker there, and he said, your son's absolutely right, it, it needs to be fixed. And so we fixed it. Now, it was so small, I could have let it go, but it's only going to get worse. And maybe you're at the point in your life where there's a lot of things that, that are small, but they grow, and they can end up destroying you. Don't think so highly of yourself that you forget that you're a sinner. The Pope... Did you see this? The Pope this week issued an apology. He actually said he had done something wrong and wanted forgiveness. Now, that's great. What he had done, maybe you saw the video, he was on a rope line and people, he was talking to people and moving. And a woman, probably a very pious Roman Catholic woman, was so enamored and so excited to be in his presence, she grabbed him and started pulling him to herself. And he pushed her away. He slapped her hand. And uh, later he apologized. He said, I should not have done that. I was impatient. And I didn't set a very good example. That's great. We've all got to come to that place in our lives where we can say that very thing. This young man is living an ethical life based on God's commandments, but the organizing principle of his life was wrong. There was something seriously wrong. So when he said, I've done all of that, the Bible says Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, one thing you lack Go, sell everything you've got and give it to the poor and come and follow me. His organizing principle for his life was wrong. You know, if you, if you play golf, you know your stance as you address the ball is very important as to where that ball's going to go. That's an organizing principle. This young man's organizing principle was the securing, the acquiring, the accumulating of wealth. He's rich, and that's the direction of his life. His, his organizing principle was accumulating wealth instead of what Jesus would have him do, and that is to give, to be not a collector, but a giver. So which is the organizing principle of your life? It may be something else. The principle is how you live your life, how you make your choices, what you think about all the time, how you spend your time, how you spend your money. That is the organizing principle of your life. And Jesus is saying it needs to be a life of giving. Turn, if you can find it quickly, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6. This is Paul writing under the inspiration of the Spirit. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. He doesn't say it's the rich. He says those who want to be rich, the organizing principle. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. This young man thinks that because he's keeping the rules as best he can, that satisfies God. But Jesus is saying, no, that's not it at all. It's not rules. It's relationship. It's having a relationship with him. Now, you're good people, and you're, I know that because you're in church on what is still a holiday weekend, and you're, you're committing to coming to church. That's good. And you try to keep the rules, and I commend you for that, but that will never get you into the kingdom of God. It's a relationship with Jesus. It's opening your heart and life to him and inviting him to be your master and your Lord. Relationship. I want you to have that. I want you to have it today. And it begins by inviting Christ into your life. Jesus is giving this young man an opportunity, but he's unwilling to take the next step. 
the next step for this young man, sell everything, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. He won't take that step. And the scripture says, at this, verse 22, at this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. And some say this is the saddest verse in the New Testament. His face fell, his countenance fell. He went away because he had great wealth. If he'd had a little bit, if he had what you had, maybe he, he could do that. But he's too wealthy. He's got too much. This is the organizing principle of his life. He, he'd be breaking the way he's always lived. And it was a step too far for him. This is the only person in Mark's gospel that Jesus called who did not say yes. I'm sure there were a lot of them, but this is the only one that's mentioned here. Jesus calls him but he walks away. And this is the last time we see him. We don't know what happens to him. He's young, so maybe, maybe he changed his mind later, but we don't really know that. There are some who think this might be Mark telling his own story. And I hope so. That'd be a great ending. But he leaves Jesus and enters a life of regret. What's the next step for you? The next step for you. I like what Oliver Wendell Holmes said. I find the great thing in this world is not so much where we stand as in the direction we're moving. So what direction are you moving? If you had to take one step today, what would it be? Maybe you're not a believer and uh, you're not ready yet. You're, you're not convinced yet. I would say the next step for you is to keep coming to church. Get into a J-term class during January. Come to these worship services and just listen. Just open your heart and see what happens. Or maybe for you, because you've done that, the next step for you is to give your heart to Christ. You've put it off long enough. Today is the day of salvation. Or for you, the next step might be, having done that, the next step is to make public your decision and be baptized. Yeah, baptized and join the church. Put your name on the dotted line. Become an active participant in church. Maybe for you, the next step is to increase your giving, to give as God has given to you. Maybe the next step for you is to finally open your mouth and tell somebody else about Christ. That neighbor, that coworker, you've kept it to yourself and now you know what God wants you to do is go to that person and talk to them about Christ. What's the next step for you? I don't know what it is, but I bet you do. And so what you need to do is take it, take that step today and enter into that relationship with Christ. I want us to pray. Would you bow with me, please? We're going to sing, and I'm going to stand at the front of the room, and I want some of you to take a step today. Do the next thing God is calling you to do, and I pray God will give you courage to do it. Father, speak to every heart now and show us what you'd have us do, and then give us the boldness and the courage to do it. We thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and we sing.